Um, hello, my name is Charles. Um, I worked with Rose uh, before we completed our PhDs together. Um, my sort of topic, um, which I'll discuss later, is called Problematizing Young People a Critical Ethnographic Investigation of ADHD. So my name is Rose. I'm an early career researcher at the University of Queensland. Um, as Charles said, we were both um, PhD students together and supervised by the same person, Professor David Fryer. I'll be talking about my research, which was about the passive unemployed, um, and it was entitled Becoming Unemployed, Subjecting and Resubjectifying um, Within Job Active. Uh, so in this presentation, we will be exploring what critical means for critical community psychology in relation to research practices. We'll discuss our PhD research and how we critique practices of ethnography and then find ways to enact a critical methodology. We were both guided by our supervisor, David Fryer, to unpack and resist a critical research practices that were incoherent with our Foucauldian inspired and reference. David consistently encouraged us to resist the production of truth claims by giving claims the status of truth, giving interlocking truth claims the status of knowledge, and posi positioning research practices as producing evidence. In this way, through David's supervision, we started our examinations into ADHD and unemployment by rejecting assumptions that knowledge corresponds to what is the case in the real world, arrived at through objective research based on traditional realist assumptions. Rather, we assume that there are indefinitely many potential real versions, each of which function at certain interests. We were also encouraged to rethink research practices with the critical concept of the constituted subject and a perpetual flux of reconstitution. This applied to the subject of research as well as the subject doing the research, i.e. me and Charles. In our knowledge work, subjectivity was positioned as material politics, the site upon which governance was enacted with subjective reassemblage, continually occurring against a changing background of rational technical politics and regional and local institutional responses. We sought to make visible the apparatus of interconnections and the broader social terrain from which they emerged, through which governmentality was enacted. To research the constitu constitution of the ADHD child and the passive unemployed, we started with Foucault's tool of critique. Contrary to other types of critical approaches that focused on the repressive notions of power, we rejected the normative ethos of the unmasking researcher, unraveling various oppressive structures of dominant versus dominated groups in society. Critique should be understood in the broadest possible way as related to doubt, pointing to the possibility of otherness. As Foucault put it, critique does not consist in saying that things aren't good the way they are. It consists in showing that things are not obvious as people believe, making it so what is taken for granted is no longer taken for granted. In particular, it consists in showing that what is taken to be necessarily so is actually contingently constituted and so unfixed and open to reimagining and reconstitution. We argue that a critical community psychology should extend this level of critique from the truthing practices out there, as in those used to constitute the ADHD child and the passive unemployed, to our own research practices. We need to find a way to refuse to be governed like that as PhD students adhering to normed research practices regulated through processes of beating milestones or adhering to template or dominant approaches to researching, to enact research that did not reproduce modern notions of linear progress, and took seriously the productivity of our research methods. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of an outline of my project now. Um, so my, my aim with the investigation was to, <clears throat> to consider the HD from outside of its dominant biomedical explanation as problematizing the rising rates of diagnosis and, and medication use. Um, but rather than engage with this problem by entering what I saw, saw as the battle of the truth to characterize the ADHD debate, my aim was to investigate the conditions that made it possible to see and do ADHD for it to be enacted by, by various professionals. Um, so my approach was not to engage ADHD as a real condition, but to reconnect it to sort of wider historic, social, political, institutional and discursive events that were influential in the formation um, of the NHS approach to ADHD. Um, what I wanted to understand was was how it was possible to say and do ADHD for it to be enacted, but I wanted to simultaneously acknowledge the sort of material existence of ADHD, but also to reject the reality of actually created by the knowledge of the discourse that constructs it as a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, for me, there's as much value in engaging in a critique that argues that it's 
<coughs> not real, um, because there is an engaging in a battle over truth from within its frame of reference. Uh, it, it's very much real, but only in so much as it's enacted daily through the actions of multiple subjects located within various domains that reinforced by and reinforcing of ADHD as a psychiatric disorder. So by considering ADHD in this way, what I was doing was following sort of Nicholas Rose, who, who highlighted that, that it's commonplace for objects of scientific knowledge to be described as not objective and as socially constructed, especially in you know, sciences such as psychology and human sciences. But as he states, this is not particularly enlightening. Um, objects of thought are constructed and thought, you know, what else could they be? Um, so he suggests a more useful approach would be to interest uh, oneself in the ways in which objects are socially constructed. So where they emerge, the authorities that are able to pronounce on them, the concepts and explanatory regimes that construct them, the problems that they solve, you know, etc. The aim here is to understand how they came to be in place, why these objects of knowledge um, and not others structure my reality and to reveal the origins and functions that have contributed to their emergence. But a problem I had was where would I begin such an investigation? Uh, ADHD, to me, appeared monolithic, um, possibly because of the rhetorical scientificness, the continued exponential rise in its application and its global reach of the knowledge that provides its visibility. Um, these elements combine, combine to provide ADHD with a, with a realness that's difficult to argue with, making it really hard to know how to engage and critique. So where does one begin with what feels like such an impenetrable reality? Uh, for me, it was the micro level, the extremities of power. Um, and for me, those, those extremities of power were the, sort of, it was the level of the everyday, where the application of the actual ADHD practice and knowledge is met with the young person. And my approach to this was to combine the sort of critical coding concept of the apparatus with an ethnographic approach. Um, but the kind of the combination of this sort of critical theory and this acritical methodology posed some tensions um, throughout the project. And then and that's what I'm trying to elaborate in this discussion today. Okay, so um my research in some respects was similar to Charles's in that I also used um, the apparatus and the ethnography to explore subjectification to subject. Mine was focused more on employment. So I went into an employment service provider in South East, uh, South East Australia to look at the daily practices um, of how the unemployed are governed in employment services. And I wanted to go beyond dominant psychological policy explanations of what the problem of unemployment is and why we should or should not need to activate the unemployed or encourage them to find work. Um, but I wanted to look at the broader processes, materialities, as well as the daily social practices that would produce unemployment as a certain type of problem. And in doing so, uh, constitute a certain type of subject. Uh, I kind of came to the research a little bit differently to Charles in that I engage with the governmentality studies literature who um, have had this recent push kind of away from uh, just using the archive to understand the um, governing and the production of subjects because um, the argument goes that the archive uh, reproduces grand narratives, particularly around neoliberalism, that it doesn't capture the ambiguity of subjectification, the contested and contradictory and failures of governing as it occurs on the ground. So I use ethnography to start with um, uh, challenges to power, to start with the messiness. Okay, start with the messiness of um, subjectification and then from there, explore how um, the various nodes of the apparatus are coordinated in order to produce um, uh, the unemployed subject in a particular way, as well as, I should add, the workers in this space. So my thesis showed that um, uh, the organisational priorities, policy, office spaces and effective governing or governing through emotions constitute and deconstitute an emotional unemployed subject. And my thesis showed that the effective governing is nuanced by following 
It's how infused emotions that inform, activate, and sustain dominant problematizations about unemployment and the unemployed and the role of employment services. But the tension that I was focused on um, is the productivity of methods, particularly the interview. So if you're going to use coding inspired um, frame of reference and then you're going to use ethnography, what is an interview um, in this? And how can we think of the interview in terms of also being kind of hooked into a different kind of apparatus that has um, uh, its own kind of ontological politics or its, its own um, uh, productive effects in, in the sex context? Okay, so our first question is, um, what is ethnography? And uh, Rose had uh, the uh, the addition of quasi in, in her ethnography. So what do you mean by quasi ethnography? How did you use that approach? Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll go a step back and I'll try and define ethnography. So ethnography is... Um, Basically, it's like a deep hanging out. It's like immersing yourself in a particular situation in order to map out cultural and social practices of a particular group, right? And it's the um, method, methodology of anthropology. And so there's a whole debate there about what is anthropology. Is it ethnography? Is it anthropology, right? Are they interchangeable? Is ethnography a method or is ethnography a way of writing? And what I've seen. Um, and a lot of these arguments center around the method um, of participant observation. Right? So if you don't have participant observation, it is not an ethnography. And there are an, quite a lot of debate in this area. So I used quasi to basically take a step back and move away from those debates. Like I don't want to engage too much in them. I, I like the idea of ethnography in terms of it's a lens, it's a way of seeing practices and how they connect and how they don't connect. Um, but I don't want to get too caught up in, did I use a participant observation? Did I do it correctly? Was I in the field for a year at a time? Or you know, how big is the corpus of material? So that's what I, that's what I did there. Yeah, but you, you didn't use quasi. Um, um, I call the critical ethnography. But I think it's doing the same thing. The critical is doing the same thing, um, and maybe for different reasons, possibly. Um, I, so yeah, I had the same the same problem in the you know ethnographies of you know what what could be considered a sort of modernist approach, and and also the you know like you say the sort of prominence of the subject within within the method itself, and so sort of they become the focus. And it's about so sort of trying to understand the sort of cultural world and sort of the meaning that's created through the ways in which the person is engaging in the world and the way in which they talk about the world. But so that gives a prominence to the person as being able to sort of describe um, describe the world. And, and, and that wasn't really what I was trying to get at. What I was interested in was um, why they were able to say and think what they were saying and thinking and, and, and what they were doing, which somehow men reconnecting and sort of looking at the ways in which knowledge had shifted across time to result in the background, the intelligible background upon what, you know, the thinking and acting, what that, you know, how that, upon which that took place. Um, so the person was almost um, maybe a lens or a way to see something, but not the person who would be able to explain it. So it was, they were just one part of of the you know the kind of the, the bigger picture of, of what would explain uh ADHD in the current moment. So yeah so my 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 kind of way of trying to avoid that was to it it was adopting sort of traditional ethnographic methods, you know, this kind of the, the being in the field for an extended period of time, you know, kind of um, observation document analysis um, conversations with people as well um, but it was guided differently I think maybe um, what was most 
what 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 drove my sort of movement around the kind of the, the field if you want was the visibility of certain statements and the kind of um wondering about where they came from and how it was possible to sort of see those things and how those things connected to the the ways in which the the practice was um able to be to be carried out and 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 i think i was also using the sort of notion of problematization which was about you know where things became mm-hmm. a problem the knowledge that was used to make something a problem so the thing that I was looking for was not necessarily the kind of cultural meaning that people were explaining to me, but the ways in which they were able to talk and the ways in which they were able to act and what it was that enabled those ways of talking and acting to be possible. So it's almost a kind of, a, um, I know, like a, I've heard this sort of notion of um, cartography and it kind of fits in that you, for me, it was more about following statements and visibility of certain um, kind of ways of acting and, and, and looking for the, the connections that made them possible and sort of following wherever they went. So it kind of decentered the person, decentered the subject as, as the kind of main focus within the ethnography. Um, and I suppose that, you know, my, my, my use, my, my, my term that I used was critical ethnography because it was being guided by a critical lens. Um, I'd replaced the sort of notion of the person as being the focus with this sort of notion of, of apparatus and, and, and that was what I was sort of using to guide me in the ways in which I sort of you know, moved around the field and, and the things that I did, the steps that I took. So, um, what was the? Well, our next question is, um, what was the problem with ethnography? Um, which is quite a wide question, and I don't know if we have the same or we had the same problems with ethnography. So, I don't know, maybe it would be worth you kind of saying a little bit about the problems that you had. I mean, we've kind of just said some of them. Okay. Um, yeah. I think I mean I certainly know there was um, another particular issue that I had, um, but maybe you want to say a little bit about what you felt the problem was with ethnography for you and your project. Yeah. Okay. I think it kind of actually connects a little bit to what you were just saying before about okay, how do we decenter the subject using these methods which inherently center the subject? Because right? ethnography. There's ethnography, but it uses participant observation and it uses interviews. And I was particularly concerned about interviews because of how it how it centers the subject, but kind of also how um, even though we may have, be able to analyze it afterwards and, and take the, the subject out in terms of using a discourse analysis or problematization analysis, the actual the doing of the interview recenters the subject, uh, both the participant and ourselves as interviewers. So I was kind of caught with the problem was, okay, well, how do we, how do we do a Foucauldian inspired interview? You know, we can do a phenomenological interview, we can do an active interview, you know, Holstein and Gubram, we, we can do those sorts of interviews. So what's, what does a Foucauldian one look like? Um, and it's actually really tricky um, because regardless of how I tried to figure it out, right? The interview itself is is just the same way that ADHD is, you know, hooked into certain kind of apparatuses that enable it um, to be thought of as a particular problem, the same as unemployment is hooked into certain apparatuses that enable it. And so, so is the interview, right? So there's always these practices within an interview that um, have histories and, and that have taken for granted assumptions that will come into our research and regardless of what we do to try and stop it. So they talk about this thing called the interview society, right, that we are in this, by the north at least, absolutely kind of immersed in interviewing. You get on the news, you get a phone call, the market interviewer. So we, we know how interviews should happen. So it's really easy to slip into the routine of how it should play out. And if you think about that 
critically, like a precoding, in the same way I'd think about how the unemployed person is interviewed and their first day of employment services and what that means in terms of truth and and knowledge and power and whatever else. We can think about the interview in in the same way. So um, I I, I sort of found that um, in in, in the enactment of interviews, the interviewee was always positioned as the knower and the expert and they should speak more. I was always positioned as um, having more power but trying to deliberately speak less to enable them to speak. There was very little contestation of problematic ideas. And even when I did try and challenge them, right, I so say um, there's an example in the thesis where uh, an employment consultant talks about unemployed as being lazy, dull budgets, right? I tried to challenge it by saying, well, the research tells us that um, they're very depressed and stressed and anxious. And so the the um, the interview itself kind of produced the this this lazy dull bludger into this depressed dull bludger. So even even trying to critique within the interview, it was still in terms of my subjectivity, we were still hooked into these different ways of thinking about the world. Butler talks about you can um, the agentic potential is is always contingent on the tool laying there to be to be picked up, right? So. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I found the interview really frustrating as a tool of critique because it just kind of reproduced other sort of problematic discourses that were only available to us from the apparatus constructed in humans and the interview and the method and how it was all coming together at that particular point. Um, And and that's the tension and the struggle that I found was that the interview itself reproduced a particular modern subject so that produced particular ways of thinking about knowledge and it, and it was frustrating as a tool of, of critique. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, the interview was a kind of, it, it doesn't seem as prominent in my work, interestingly. Um, okay. the, the, there was interviews and there was sort of, but they weren't, they weren't so pre, um, sort of pre-organized. They weren't central to the project. They weren't pre-organized, and you know, there was no sort of set questions that uh, you know, semi-structured interview that I might adopt. Um, you know, with numbers of people that I, you know, this sort of traditional way we would approach um, interview within it within a qualitative approach. Um, you didn't all, have to identify them. There wasn't any ethics. There wasn't any recruitment well, no, was, or any practices. Was, but yeah, I'm said political practices. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's there because you have to sort of say the things that you might do in mm. in in the project. So it was kind of there was a possibility that I would do interviews, but it, it was more it was more that I may talk to people um, about things that they say. Uh, because it was the things that they say that was important to the project. So it would almost be impossible to have conducted the project without actually speaking to people. Um, But it was about this sort of status that was attributed to what was said that I think was important, or what was important in in my work. So, So whilst I was asking people things and exploring the things that they said, it was more about trying to understand, you know, what they could say um, in this situation. And from being able to say it, you know, what made it possible to say it. You know, so when they were talking about a child um, having ADHD, and, you know, someone like a psychiatrist would say something along the lines of it could be a neurodevelopmental disorder and it had a sort of genetic basis and blah, 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 blah. Whereas if I spoke to a teacher and they would say ADHD, they were both using the same term, but the description applied was completely different. So it would be about, oh, you know, it's a reaction to sort of poverty. It was just a reaction to kind of like attachment issues. So the framing and, and this discussion of the concept of ADHD was different depending on the people who spoke. Mm-hmm. And what I found interesting, what I tried to, to do with that was to wonder and explore how it was possible for that person to to say all of those things and for ADHD be, to be that thing that they spoke. Um, so the, the interviews were more or less conversations, open-ended conversations that, that, that just occurred in the moment with people. Um, 
So I would be in a health service, for example, and I'd be talking to people. They would ask about the project, what I was doing, and I'd give a bit of a summary of it. And then that would lead into a conversation. And, you know, and, and those were the conversations that, that led to, you know, further discussions. So I would sort of say, oh, well, that's really quite interesting. We might like having a further conversation with you about that. And we would explore the topic that came up in the, the, the general conversation in a bit more detail. So it was almost being guided by the statements that were made by individuals. And this was the same within the school setting. So I would visit schools and talk to people about the project and they would start to just say things about ADHD. And I would be, you know, interested in having that conversation in the moment and then asked to have further conversation with it. So my interviews were determined by the conversations that I was having and the sort of willingness to be able to continue that conversation in a different setting. And it was not about providing or gaining some truth about ADHD or some sort of you know specific knowledge about ADHD. It was more about a starting point maybe for following a pathway or a connection or whatever you want to call it, backwards, outwards, to understand the background that made it possible for that person to see it. So there was something about the way that I was viewing the words spoken um, by someone and the, the kind of the prominence I was giving that within the mm. overall project because it was just one part of a bigger picture of things that, that included, you know, kind of, clinical case notes, so things written about people over a period of time, policies that were being enacted currently, but also historically. Um, the kind of visibility of poverty and things around the place as well. So it was almost, you know, kind of what does it like to be in this place where I'm conducting this project? The people speaking were just an element of this bigger kind of collection of elements that provided a sort of a redescription, if you want, of of the background, I think, that allowed the practice of ADHD to be around. Yeah. And for me, that that sort of background had disappeared and had been replaced with kind of, you know, current ideas about what ADHD was. So I was trying to retrace back out and understand that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so the kind of the interviews were not interviews per se, um, but more conversation that could be followed or understood in relation to a background um, mm. or connect to made it possible to speak that way. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because the way that you describe your conversations then, it, it sounds very much like um, how an ethnographer would talk about how they interviewed, how they found it. So it's kind of a classic kind of ethnography mm. then. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's not because you're decentering and the person, absolutely. But I'm just sitting here thinking, like, well, how would you, if you were going to publish your research right in a, in a psychology journal, and you were going to do that, um, would you get away with describing your research that way? Probably not, because there's all of these these rules, these regimes of truth about how we produce knowledge and what counts as quality and everything else. Mm -hmm. So. I'm just kind of stuck here a little bit on, on the, the different ways that we approach interviews and think about them, um, but I'm still hearing different different regimes of truth kind of assumptions kind of going on in the background, and I guess I'm really interested in well, how do we make those obvious and front and centre because we can't, as you say, we can't avoid talking to people in a sense, mm -hmm. and we should want to talk to people. We should want to, to know about the mundane and the nitty-gritty of people's lives, right? But, but how do we do it in a way in which challenges, because if we don't talk about it, it I think it, it, it pops into routines, pops into super routines in the phrase, but that's what frustrates me in some critical research, right, is that they don't bring this conversation to centre, and so it, it's just assumed. And, yeah. and with that, then, all of the other assumptions creep into your research. Yeah. It's even just the engaging with it as a, as a, as a, as a, you know, a thing. It's kind of bringing it, trying to, you know, there might not be an answer to it. It might be that the answer that we come up with is suitable for what we're doing, but it is not an answer for someone else. But it's the willingness to engage with that, the willingness to sort of put it front and centre for your project, the willingness to sort of try to challenge yourself to not reproduce these kind of ways of doing things um, and try to, you know, by not by not reproducing, by trying to challenge them, you, you know, you might develop or move something somewhere yeah. that can provide 
a solution to something else that then is taken forward by someone else. It's that's the, the the not fixing or breaking down what looks fixed, yeah. um, and that that process of engaging it and, and and challenging it and showing that it's not fixed is kind of the critical for me. That's what it is. It's the the not doing what you are supposed to do. Mm. And trying to challenge that always, but without really knowing what you will do, or what you will do in a way. That was kind of my sense of it. Um, yeah, it's kind of who knows what will happen here. You know, and, and, and you know, a sort of really practical point with that was, and, and it goes back to what you say about journals, ethics and ethics application. I mean, was a nightmare situation because it was not according to rules set out within policy guidelines regarding ethics with human subjects and you know that that in itself is just it's really problematic um sort of notion for the research that i was doing so it's kind of like you know i was having to go through an ethics board that was looking at human subjects in a completely different way from what i was and 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 what i had to try to emphasize was the person was not important it was the what was said that was important and that what was said can only be said because of an intelligible background that surrounds them. And I was interested in the background. What made it possible for that to be said? That's what I was trying, yeah, and I'm actually trying that's to really that. Sorry? Yeah, I think it's really good that you actually mentioned that and that in your ethics process, you still tried to do it. You didn't just kind of go, oh, this is ethics, but I'm just going to play by the rules to get it through, yeah. that you remained consistent with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And, it was, and, and it was interesting because it's, it got through. It was allowed to happen. Um, yeah. And it was the, I think, the kind of the being able to explain the problem and the challenge that I was trying to put forward yeah. um, in, a, in a way that was... I don't know, kind of not consistent with the requirements because it wasn't, but it was more about um, why do I want to do this and what's the benefit of doing it this way? Um, And it was able, you know, sort of highlighting this sort of other way of thinking about the person and and, and the other way in which that person, the subject, was situated within my research. Um, I think that that was important. That was the really important part. And mm. being con- not consistent, but being able to explain then, you know, as, I suppose it's the kind of ontological, epistemological, methodological connections there. So if the person is not this within my research, what is the thing mm. that I'm trying to engage with? And mm. how then do I engage with it? And being able to sort of connect up those into an explanation that someone else can think with. Um, and I think that's maybe what I was doing with the ethics process. It's only just, I'm just thinking about it now as I'm, as I'm talking yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting too. And I really liked, and it connects into the ethics, but what you were saying before about you know, the, the critical bit is holding on to things being unfixed. And I wonder if, and, and, and holding um, criticalness and challenging methods along with the objects that we're researching, right? Um, and I wonder if that is how we refuse to do evidence, how we refuse to produce evidence, it's because we're, we refuse to say that this is a fixed knowledge claim. Even, even though even in, you know, usual science, they, they won't say that because they talk about falsification and, and progress and every, everything else. But we're doing something slightly different, I think. Yeah, uh, I think that's this, the, 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 um, the truth claims and the evidence stuff. Um, I found really hard to sort of, to sort of work, get my head around that. Um, it was a really difficult question, and 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 you know I kind of tried to hold on to way through the project, but I found it quite a difficult concept to kind of to to sort of work out. Um, you know, it's it's the notion of truth claims. It's the notion of claims. You know, it's kind of a, by by saying something, 
isn't it a claim? And it seems like to, to not make truth claims then means to not to not say something which seems at odds with the whole kind of critical project. It's about saying something, it's about challenging things that exist. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure of, I, I I yeah, I kind of struggle with the idea of how to not make truth claims when trying to challenge and trying to sort of challenge existing ways of thinking about things that are so obviously problematic. You know, you think of ADHD, you think of what happens and that's problematic. Um, yeah. How do you how do you how can you not challenge that? And how can you um, not make claims when challenging that? So yeah, I find I find that really, really hard um, to grapple with. Um, useful to grapple with, but really difficult one to sort of to square, I suppose. It is really challenging, right? Because like my kind of reaction right through the thesis, well, what's the point of doing research, right? If if we if we can't produce claims of any thought, and if if research, the whole point of it is to produce knowledge. Mm. In, in in some sense, then you know I I got into like places of um, like cul de sacs and I got paralyzed and just stuck, um, which was really frustrating because uh, as you say, like the reason I research unemployment is because I can't stand the way that it gets individualized and the unemployed get pathologized and then get caught up in punitive welfare regimes and whatever else. And so you, you want to be part of, of producing alternative ways of thinking about unemployment um, in, in order to challenge these dominant models. Um, so so how, how can you do that, um, as you say, without making truth claims or at least without making a claim? Mm-hmm. And for for me, the um, I think what where it maybe made sense to me or made it a sense to me was um, I always had so at the same time as I was trying to hold that that kind of thought that 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 sort of challenge through the project, I also mm-hmm. remember reading something about um, how 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 do you how do you not finish something? How do you keep something in account? Sort of moving and unfinished, and I, you know, I remember starting the project and sort of reading it and then being a bit baffled by it um, because, it, it, yeah, it seemed confusing and and you know, was unable to sort of explain that to myself. Um, but it was towards the end of the project where it somehow made more sense, and it and it, and it kind of led me to sort of to you know. Um, and I suppose an answer that I found acceptable to the notion of truth claims and producing evidence, and it was the focus was on the ADHD and and how it was possible for that way of doing it to be in place, and the project ran over you know four years, and by the time I was finished it. It, it kind of was meaningless um, in some senses because the the focus on ADHD had shifted to something else. Um, mm-hmm. It had become autism. So the, the talk within the service had sort of moved away from ADHD yeah. and was much more focused on autism, which is consistent with the notion of the apparatus because it's the same elements of work, but it allows for different things to occur within it. So yeah. that, you know, that sort of shift from one to the other, but within the same sort of connections was really sort of illuminating for me um, because it highlighted that my work was was unfinished um, because it you know I was only describing something within a, a bigger sort of um, connection or story or something or narrative so it was only a snapshot of something that mm. had started long before I started the project and will continue long after I finished the project. And it was that, the sort of boundary of the project and the sort of being really artificial and just sort of snapping it onto a place that I decided to look. It was that part. So it was kind of, it's unfinished. It's, un, it's it, you know, it continues to move and it's making that front and centre and making that clearly, you know, a statement. And that, that was kind of, what I did, so it was kind of like to, to, to finish the project was was to present 
it's kind of um, that it was no longer the main issue, the main focus, and that it kind of become almost obsolete in the process of yeah. doing the work. Which is kind of pretty risky strategy to take when you're doing a PhD, which is kind of like you're undermining your own work. Yeah. But for me, that was part of the how do you not make truth claims? How do you not produce evidence? And it wasn't the sort of like the undermining idea. For me, it was about the sort of um, Haraway's uh, work about, you know, kind of a power charge conversation. Um, and that's what I found really interesting this sort of notion of a power charge um, conversation and it kind of being, you know, knowledge being situated in, you know, kind of a particular place at a particular point in time um, and as produced by a particular person with their own particular histories. Mm. And it being situated and bringing that out and sort of putting it into this sort of larger power charge conversation that is occurring beyond you and allowing other people to engage in that conversation, to challenge it, to be open to that challenge. For me, that is making claims or making statements, but being willing to not accept them as fixed truths or, you know, as evidence of something. It's about here is something that is to be engaged with, to be thought with, to be used, um, but also to be challenged, to be critiqued and to be, you know, able to be used as a stepping off point into something else. So it's highlighting the sort of movement, the continued movement, um, in a way highlights that it's not fixed, which the fixedness is what I associate with the kind of truth claims and evidence. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think um, I didn't engage with Haraway in as much detail as you did. I kind of moved more towards ontological politics, but I think there's actually quite a lot of synergies here in, in that. So, you know, the work of Anne Marie Moll. Um, and talking about research as um, productive and intervening in the world. And Carol Backey picks up ontological politics and, to, and asks us to think about our research in terms of problematization, like what have we problematized through our research and what sort of objects, subjects and spaces has, has that produced discursively. Um, and so I, I think of my research now as a way of, um, I guess, it being part of a power charge conversation in terms of thinking very critically about unemployment and what research does and what kind of, what story, what account of unemployment are we producing through this research? What is that contributing to the conversation? How can we encourage other people to pick it up, even if it's only bits of it? If I can encourage somebody working in employment services not to think about the unemployed person as a lazy doll budget, but to think about unemployment much more politically, economically, socially, um, then we're intervening in a world in sense um, and moving moving what is I, I see a very stagnant conversation moving it forward so it's there's a sense of movement I think um, uh, when we think about research politically and I guess it would be a way to kind of connect what you were saying and what I just said with praxis mm. ultimately yeah 